inspire you, or there will be some parallel in your own life that will help you look at a challenge, an obstacle, an opportunity a little bit differently. First though, I'd like to do a very quick tutorial on what is climbing, because there's a lot of different perceptions. The most common one is the scene in Mission Impossible, <laughs> you know, where Tom Cruise has one hand and he's just hanging there in free space, no rope, no nothing, and the helicopter whirs around and tells him there's a mission. So I don't do that. <laughs> This is actually an all-women's trip that I did informally many years ago to the top of Mount Morgan, a peak that's almost 14,000 feet. And you can see that's pretty challenging terrain, at least to do for several miles, but you don't have a major risk of falling off of a cliff and you don't have to use any technical equipment like ropes and harnesses. So that's considered climbing, and you can still get a great sense of achievement from doing things like that. This is more vertical or technical <laughs> rock climbing, so when you're going straight up a face and using rope for protection. I do do that a little bit, but it's not my main passion. So it's really funny once you get into a sport, you know, the people that are bouldering give the people that are doing this kind of climbing a hard time, and they all kind of think that the people that do this are crazy. And this is one of my favorite kinds of climbing, snow climbing. So you can see that they're basically walking up a mountain. It's usually hiking. Sometimes you face in, but many times you don't. And they're using crampons on their feet. Those are the spiky things that you put on the bottom of your boots to get purchased into firm snow or ice. And an ice axe in case you fall, you use that to arrest your own fall. So you're never actually connected to the mountain. You have to use dynamic forces in order to keep yourself on or to stop a fall. And then there's ice climbing, which I think is pretty fun, but also pretty dangerous. But it's something I do from time to time to try to stretch myself in terms of the physical and mental aspects, so that if I get on just a little bit steeper snow or ice, I don't freak out, because I've been on vertical ice before, so I'm always trying to push my own limits. And then this is my absolute favorite kind of climbing. It's called glacier climbing. This happens to be on Mount McKinley, or uh, better known as Denali. And this particular area right here is called the Valley of Death. I chose not to do this route because I really didn't like the name. <laughs> but it gives you a sense that you have to navigate through all of those crevasses and try to find a safe passage. And if you fall into one, what you do is you're connected to other climbers, so you have to stop each other's fall. And if you can't prussic out, if you can't ascend a rope on your own, they'll build a pulley and pull you out. So it's also really interesting because there's a lot of teamwork aspects to it. It's also very technical, and it's physically strenuous, but in a different way than just going straight up. <clears throat> so if I had to summarize the main thing that I took away from climbing and how it changed me was that all of these many lessons along the way helped me figure out how to look at obstacles differently. Because it sounds kind of pessimistic, but I feel like life is a series of obstacles. We have goals, we have dreams, we have you know, things we want, relationships, kids, and all that, and there are often things that come and step in our way. So whether it's bad weather or a layoff or a divorce, those are obstacles. And by looking at an obstacle differently, there it can completely shut you down and you stop and you have to turn around on your mountain and never come back. Or you say, how can I get around it? Or how can I learn from this so that I can come back and try the same exact thing again and hopefully be successful? So it's incredibly um, built resilient, a resilience building. So as a good ex-MBA, you know, corporate type, I had to come up with my own five Ps <laughs> to summarize these lessons. So we'll go through each one of them. So preparation. This is probably one of the biggest things for me, especially as a small woman. So to compete in the area of mountaineering, a male-dominated sport, extreme physical demands, I literally was like the last one picked for dodgeball when I was growing up. <laughs> I was officially on the volleyball team and I was on the bench. Game after game after game. I ran track, ran track in junior high and I got the spirit award because I came in last every single day <laughs> and I still kept showing up. So I'm not kidding when I tell you that I'm not an athletic person. Sometimes we tend to 
project on other people like, oh, they can do it. They're totally genetically gifted. I can't do it. But the truth is, I am not genetically gifted. Everything I have done has been because I researched. I determined what I needed to do. I was disciplined and I executed. So I got prepared for every single mountain that I've ever done in the way that needed to be done. And if I didn't, I didn't summit, and I, I learned from that too. I can't skip. This is not a genetically gifted body that can come off the couch and go do this stuff. And the same thing applies to the corporate world. How many times have you showed up and you're the only woman at a board meeting, and they look you up and down and go, what's this chickadee gonna have to offer? And you better be prepared, because if you're not, your credibility is shot. It's unfair, yes, but it is the truth. And that's why when I started climbing, I went out and I did all this research and I hired some of the best guiding companies, and I picked those guides' brains mercilessly. I knew that for snow climbing and glacier climbing, I needed to have really good snow skills. So I went on the Sierra Club snow camping training, and I became a leader. So I figured out what were all of these aspects of this multidisciplinary field, and I went out and I acquired those skills very methodically. And it worked. And it took time. So I've been doing this for over 10 years now. It definitely did not happen overnight. And there's definitely, you spend some time in the field. So this is practicing crevasse rescue, where I'm there lowering this fellow to his death. Um, <laughs> now we lower down into crevasses, and we practice pressing out. And it's really scary even when you're practicing, because it's a very claustrophobic space. It's very cold, and you get the feeling of like, what if this really happened in real life? And it is physically challenging to ascend a rope. There's a technique to it and tools to it, but it's still really tough. You must but know. you can't take preparation for granted in anything that you do, and especially not in the outdoors. The next important thing is partners. And I did learn this from the mountains, unfortunately, more than I learned <laughs> in my personal life. And it's really important you know that the people that surround you, the people that you choose to have in your circle, and you choose who is there, whether it's your domestic partner, whether it's your friends, whether it's what company and what team are you in, the people that are around you are so incredibly important to your daily life and your experience and your mindset. So when you come home and you have to do the data dump of all of the horrible things this outrageous, outrageous person said to you, and it makes your heart <coughs> suffer, <laughs> you know, it does no one any good. So having partners in your life that are positive influences, and especially that can keep their cool when the proverbial shit hits the fan, is so incredibly important. So in 2008, I had broken my collarbone doing something very, very dangerous, cycling. <laughs> and, <laughs> and one of my best climbing buddies, Jeff, had this goal of doing the Palisades Traverse in the Sierra Nevada. It's four of the 14,000 foot peaks in a row. It's the highest concentration of 14ers. And it's a really coveted goal, and it's really, really tough. And he said, well, I'm waiting for you. This is your birthday present until you get better from your collarbone break. Now the timing didn't work out perfectly so that I had gotten my pin out of my shoulder yet, but I rationalized that I still had the pin holding the collarbone together, so that was good. Instead, <laughs> after I get the pin out, I'd have to wait at least a few weeks for a good deal. So we decided we would go, go ahead and give this mountain a try. You know, there's something to trying and saying, well, if I go too far, I can always come back, or making sure that I have just enough I'm climbing just enough in the gym, I'm hiking just enough, I think this could be possible, and if not, well, let's talk about contingency plans, but I didn't hold myself back from trying. You might doubt my sanity for doing this, but that was my rationalization. So we've really set our sights, this is the whole Palisades Traverse, but we said our primary objective is to do this arete right here on Mount Sill. So this is a 14,000 foot peak, and it's about 1,200 feet of technical rock climbing, so that vertical rock climbing. That's really hard to do at altitude. It's very, very strenuous. And depending on the time we would make, we have different bailout points when we try to make other peaks. <coughs> so this is the infamous Jeff. Everyone needs a, a buddy like Jeff who's really supportive and encouraging and, and says, you know, I'll be there for you. We're going to do this together. He also brings 
um, several baked potatoes, which is <laughs> really good when you're hungry in the back country. So as we're climbing, we get up somewhere around this point here, and there's this very infamous move, the crux move is the hardest move on a climb, where you're on one piece of rock and you, they call it the reach around, and that's not naughty, that's just what it's called. <laughs> so you have to reach around and get into a crack system and there's just the void here, just total space, a few thousand feet. So a lot of people really have trouble with it. <laughs> and I say, I think I've blown, blown the pin, this is serious, we need to get down as quickly as possible, but I don't want to look at, look at it, I don't want to talk about it, I want to like try to tune it out. Because you know if you ever have a blister when you're hiking, Somebody's like, how's your blister? How's your blister? How's your blister? How's your blister? Like, I just forgot about it. <laughs> so the only way down was to keep climbing up and to summit because you actually can't back down this route. So we did. And as we're coming down, we're trying to figure out what route we're going to take because now we need to take a non-traditional route to get me down quickly. We can't go climb another 14er and then descend one of our predetermined routes. So we found this section here, and this is actually a rope looking drag straight down. This is about 3,000 feet here. So this is pretty um, steep would be an understatement. And it was very scary that every single section as we're rappelling down, because we couldn't create real rappel stations or real anchors, it was, it was pretty sketchy. Sketchy is the word for really scary. <laughs> <laughs> and in every section, I would say, okay, we just have to get through this section and try not to think actually about the other sections that were to come. Like, we just need to focus on this and do this safely, but then another section would come and go, oh, this is equally scary. Okay, we just have to focus on this and do this safely. And we got back down to about here when Jeff dropped his pack, which is a bad thing, lost all of the water inside. And there are formations where a glacier meets a mountain that's called a bergschrit. And it's a crevasse that's just where a uh, glacier kind of pulls away, so it's a really big crack. Mm -hmm. On all of the other known descent routes, you will rappel into the berg shrimp and you can walk out. But we weren't sure what would happen once we got into this berg shrimp. And sure enough, we came into this big icy cave, found his pack. I love your expression. <laughs> 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 looked over and like, oh no, there's a, a 30 foot cliff and there's nothing, it's all smooth ice. We didn't bring ice screws because we weren't doing an ice climb. There's no way to protect it, no way to down climb it. So then we were able to climb up over the lip and it's another 30 foot drop, but there's about oh, just a little ice horn that we were able to lasso the rope on, get on rappel and slither on down. And that was probably the scariest part. Then we're like, this has all taken so long and I'm still in a lot of pain. And the sun's about to set, so do we go back the way we came, which was extremely steep and icy, and risk falling, because you're much more likely to fall going downhill, and now I'm compromised for my ability to self-arrest? Or do we go ahead and traverse the entire glacier, and then come back around the, the glacial moraine? So adding on about six times the distance, but much more safety. So we decided to do that, and we literally jogged across this glacier, kind of jumping over crevasses. It's very dry, so you could see them. There wasn't a lot of danger of falling in, but it's still kind of a crazy situation. The whole time, we're not fighting or arguing. Like, imagine those times when you're like running late and you're lost and your friend or your spouse is in the car and you start <laughs> shouting at each other and you start to like lose your mind and then you make a wrong turn because you're fighting. And, like, it's so easy to do, and it would have been so easy to do here. I could have gotten really angry with him for dropping his pack. He could have gotten really angry with me for, you know, having an accident, and now everything was getting all screwed up on our descent. But we just kept focusing on what do we have to do next and getting through the next section safely. We ended up making it across the entire glacier and down most of the moraine, but there was no moonlight and we couldn't figure out where to cut left to go back to our camp. It's just this huge expanse of like car-sized boulders you're climbing up and over. It becomes very mind-numbing and you lose your sense of direction. So I found this one little sandy spot here. This is like 10.30 p.m. And I'm trying to convince Jeff we should cut our losses and try to stay stay the night here and he's just desperate. Must get back to sleeping bag, you know, hungry, thirsty, 
I know I can find it. And I was like, I don't think so. We're going to lose the spot. It's the only spot we found. Otherwise, we have to be laying on cold, jagged rock. So, you know, no, you can't have your five more minutes to keep looking. This, this is it. So we spent, we put the rope down for insulation against the ground, and we were not prepared for an overnight, because when you're rock climbing, you're trying to keep your pack as light as possible. And just put on every single bit of clothing, put the rope bag around us. We totally sandwiched together, and, and at the time, we both had significant others. We're like, they'll forgive us. <laughs> <It's for survival. laughs> and I, every 30 minutes, we'd like switch around. My shoulder was killing me, and these horrible gusts of wind were coming and making us shiver. And, when somebody tells you it's the longest night of their life, they got, they got nothing. <laughs> so we ended up getting all the way down, and my car had been vandalized. Oh. If you guys heard about it, it was like six or seven years ago. Somebody had been going up and down the 395 and vandalizing cars and slashing tires and siphoning gas. So there was my poor little doodlebug. That's her name. <laughs> Smashed in. And it just didn't even phase me. Yeah. Couldn't even touch me because I was so happy to survive that situation. Yeah. And in fact, I told Jeff once we saw this, I said, That's right, mother, you know whatters. Bring it on. You can't touch us. And then we started driving, and then it went clunk, 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 clunk. Because they'd also slash my tire, and Jeff, don't say that again. <laughs> so there's a whole story about how we even got back home after this because, you know, tire, windshields. You know, missed work, the whole thing. But the lesson was that he was the right partner. I didn't know it until we were in that situation. But anybody else, we could have totally freaked out, lost our heads, been fighting, and made one bad decision along the way. And I might not be talking to you today. So Jeff, I will do anything anywhere around the world with him. And I'm trying to find partners in anything that I do that are people that are like that. And in fact, you might recognize some of them here, these three FWA members. But as you're thinking about those partners, I really believe in supporting other women along the way. When I have an opportunity to hire an equally qualified man or woman, I always pick the woman. Reverse discrimination? No, because you're equally qualified, right? <laughs> Not that at all. But what I have found in some of my situations with the new business is that these people are the ones that go to bat for me because they're part of my network and they believe in my mission. They're not just service providers. <coughs> oh, I'm such a weenie. Okay. <laughs> now I continue to climb because it helps me reset my perspective. I don't seek those kinds of situations. <laughs> I get plenty of perspective resetting without it being justified, but that one did a particularly good job on me. <laughs> So another story I have about that comes from Mount Rainier, and this is one of my very first climbs. I had actually been struggling to figure out how to do Rainier because the main outfitter, RMI, uh, I will badmouth them a little bit. They have a bad reputation for kind of running the clients ragging, ragged and then bagging and tagging them. Oh, you can't make it. We're going to put you here with your sleeping bag, and then we're going to come back down and get you. And I knew that I was small, but I had the juice. I wasn't very fast, but I could do this. So I found a different opportunity with American... Um, uh, Alpine Inst Institute International, and we were doing a fundraiser <coughs> for cancer. And in this particular climb, it was really interesting because everyone else that was climbing, as usual, they were all male, but they had all been touched by cancer. They either had it personally or a loved one had had it, and I was the only one there that was just joking about using my mountaineering skills for good instead of evil for a change. <laughs> but it was really cool to be on that team, and the crazy thing about it was, even really, really early on, I'd only climbed like two mountains, I was a role model for them, for all of these guys, because they had just done their crevasse rescue class, and this would be their first mountain ever. So they were like, wow, you have experience. Mm -hmm. So here I am, the smallest woman, and having these guys look up to me. Was actually, I was a little uncomfortable with it because I knew how much I didn't know. But <laughs> <laughs> basically, by this point, we uh, had already been hiking for like five hours. The packs are, are starting to approach 60 pounds, and really, like totally back-breaking. And you're going, we haven't even touched the glacier yet. So these are people 
these little ants here. Mm -hmm. So we still have to go up this really steep slope and over onto the inner glacier before we can make camp. And everybody's pretty much demoralized. It's just a really, really tough approach. And this one young guy, Jason, comes up to me. He's like 22, total young buck, enthusiastic. And he asks me how I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, I'm great. How are you? And he's like, you're great. I'm tired and thirsty and hungry that I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. And I was like, oh, I'm tired and hungry and thirsty too, and I'm not sure if I'm going to make it, but that's why I'm great. This is, <laughs> this is mountaineering. You know, they're not giving these mountains away. <laughs> he was like, so that means I'm doing great too? And I was like, yeah, you're doing awesome. And the funny thing was, like, I was being completely authentic with him, but I didn't realize what an impact I would have on him. Like, imagine if I had said, you're tired now? Just wait. Just wait. You have no idea what's in my train enough? You know? And because he looked up to me as, as a role model, and what I said would influence how he felt about himself and about the climb. And we had some tough moments. I mean, we were going through terrain like this. It's pretty scary stuff. And then on our summit day, there was a lightning, an electrical storm up high. And being up high on Rainier with lots of metal stuff on you is not really the best place to be in an electrical storm. So the guides uh, wisely chose it. They actually didn't say, let's descend. They said, let's sit here and watch it and see if it gets worse or if it dissipates. And thankfully, it dissipated. But this is at 3 o'clock in the morning. Sitting on my pack on a steep, icy slope, trying not to fall asleep and roll down the mountain. <laughs> and we all made it to the top. And this is Jason here. He was so excited. I mean, it, I can't even tell you like how much it did for this person. And the rest of the time, pretty much after that comment, he had a bounce in his step. Like, oh, I love this. Like, suffering is normal. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> I, it was really the first time that I realized two things. One was the power of thought. So nothing changed about his experience. He didn't train any differently. He couldn't change what was in the past. He didn't come with any different preparation. The weather wasn't any different than it would have been. But the way he thought about it, how he was performing changed. And that was it. And I guarantee that that had a lot to do with how he did and how he felt about that climb. The second thing was, I didn't realize before that, that my words had power, and that I could influence someone else, for better or for worse. And we often really don't think about ourselves as having a lot of power, but every single one of you has the potential to do that for another human being. So don't forget that. <coughs> Perseverance. <laughs> my fourth P. It is really probably one of the seminal things about mountaineering. There aren't many other sports where you will go back to the same mountain year after year after year and do the same route over and over again and potentially keep turning around, but you don't let go of that goal. So I did Mount, Mount Whitney four times before I got it, but the first three were in winter conditions and a hard route. So on Mount Shasta, this is my very first successful climb. I had already tried several unsuccessfully. And different things have turned me around, mostly weather, partners. But at this point, I had invested like eight months into mountaineering, putting the time in training, putting the time in with the skills, acquiring the, the gear and testing it. So I was getting a little frustrated that eight months, <laughs> maybe this isn't meant for me. I don't know. But I really, really loved it. So I tried Mount Shasta, and I did it with, with guides. And Mount Shasta is pretty tough. So we camp at around 10,500 feet, and again, it's the usual 50, 55 pound pack that you're um, climbing with. And then you have to go up this 3,000 foot steep slope, and then you still have a few more thousand feet to go. So as you're sitting here looking at this, and you, the summit isn't even in view, and it's so intimidating. It's really easy to say there's no way that I can do this. And a lot of people will say, you know, I'm staying at camp. I don't think I'm up for this. But you have to think about what's that summit? What's that objective? What's that job? What's that whatever it is? Marathon. 
and it feels intimidating. But there's a series of segments. So my first goal was just to get to Helen Lake and get to camp and then see what happened. And then to get up in the middle of the night, because we often climb at night, the snow is firmer, so this is at like 1.30 in the morning, and just go through the motions and get all my gear on and then take one step after another. And I would literally use the exercise to say, can I take another step? Yes. And if I do, if I can, then I do. Instead of thinking, can I take 10,000 more steps? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty daunting, right? I'm still in the back of my mind thinking, I have to have enough energy to go down, right? But not go too far. But if I say yes, then I keep going. And that makes it really, really reasonable to find a, a short-term goal and just take each step going towards that goal. And here we are at the top of the Red Banks, uh, the top of that 3,000 foot slope. And I remember asking my guide if he thought I could make it or not. And thankfully he said yes, because <laughs> he probably could have influenced me to turn around otherwise. So I've had lots of great male mentors along the way too, which is, uh, which is also important. So now I do things all the <laughs> Yeah, so I made it to the top. And the thing about it was, I looked back and I said, if I hadn't taken any single one of those steps, I wouldn't have make it, made it to the top. Taking those intermediate or interim steps doesn't guarantee that you will get to the top, but you cannot get there if you don't take the steps moving in that direction. So we do this a lot with our own objectives and go, it's too big, it's too far away, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough time, but if you break it down into goals, so where's CFA go? CFA go. You know, sign up for the class, start buying the books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And things start to set in motion, and you just focus on passing level one, and then the next year, level two. But just thinking about the CFX is actually really tough. Uh, thinking about the whole program and how many years all at once can be really overwhelming. And then the final P, this is very influential in terms of how much you're able to apply yourself to your objective. So if you have an objective of running a marathon, but it's because somebody else wants you to do it, your heart's not going to be in it, right? Or like when uh, I did Mount McKinley, and I do this just with my boyfriend, a team of two, is often an interesting dynamic with men and women in the outdoors physical differences, risk tolerance, whatnot. If I had had a bad time on Denali, <laughs> because it was his idea, we would have been in trouble. So thankfully, Denali was my idea. And it was probably one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. Denali is 20,320 feet high in Alaska, and you climb in the middle of summer where the sun never really sets. So we did a night schedule because the snow would be more firm climbing at night, so we'd sleep during the day and then climb all night. This is probably around 1 a.m. or so, and so the sun never goes down. It always glows. It's a little more pink or purple, and the projectors change it more blue. But it's totally magical. However, Denali also comes with a lot of suffering, and I've never been colder in my life. I've never been more physically challenged. There were multiple times in the middle of the night when I had nothing else to do mentally but count. And I counted to a thousand with every step. One, two, and then I counted to a thousand again. And that's really, really tough to do when you're in that terrain and keep awake and alert and deal with the cold. But it's because I love it so much. So if you're suffering, I mean, there's a lot of things where the, the obstacles seem constant or it seems like a lot of suffering, like starting your own business just is really a huge um, challenge going into a new career, moving to a new place. But if the passion is behind it, it makes it feel that much more worthwhile. So on Denali, we got up to about 16,500 feet. We were doing a slightly harder route because why would you go to Denali and do an easy <laughs> route, right? So this is the Bergstrom camp, so the glacier is actually pulling away right there, and we dug in a platform. And on this day, it was so strenuous to build up, dig out all of those snow blocks and move them around. One of the things about altitude is you go higher, the oxygen gets thinner, but as you go further north, it also gets thinner. So 16,500 feet, 
And Alaska actually feels like 19,000 feet, or it did to me. Mm. So, so much work moving and digging and all of that at that altitude, and pretty stressful with the steep slopes all around you. And I came down, and the next day I was like, I don't know, I think maybe we should do a rest day. This is going to be, I'm going higher than ever before. We're carrying full packs up this slope. I'm going to come down the normal route. And the next day after that, I'm oh, sorry, on that rest day, we actually saw two people fall to their, their death on Denali. Yeah. It was the first time I'd ever actually seen death in the mountains. You know, you hear about it on the news, and it's very sensationalized, but it's actually quite rare. And they fell onto our route, and we were the only two people in this particular camp doing that route. And uh, some people we knew or had met rushed over, and one gal had tears in her eyes, and she was worried it had been us and was really thankful that it wasn't. So that gave me some pause, and I said, you know, we've basically marched up this mountain in good weather or bad. I think we need to take a few more rest days and acclimatize a little bit more. Unfortunately, the following day, we started to go up the normal route just to play around and get some exercise. Exercise helps facilitate red blood creation, or red blood cell creation. And I was struck down by this horrible pain in my side. Every time I would expand my breath, I would just be shut down. And has anyone ever had a uh, broken rib before? No, no broken ribs in this room. So we waited out three more days and kept trying to climb up, and each day I was shut down quicker and quicker. And, and kind of as a self-respecting climber, you don't want to go to the ranger medic tent on 14,000 feet on Denali. It's the one station on the entire mountain. So we wanted to be self-sufficient and not use resources. But finally, I was like, maybe I do need a rescue. Like, breathing is pretty critical <laughs> anywhere, and especially there. And um, so I went to the ranger tent, so you can see I'm like really in a lot of, lot of pain there. And they checked me out, and they said, you know, I can't, it doesn't seem like it's um, any kind of pneumothorax or hole in your lung, but you know the deal. At altitude, you don't get better. You just get worse. Your recovery is compromised because there's not enough oxygen in the air. So we actually had to go down from our 14 camp all the way out and carry all of our own stuff. I did a self-evacuation because I didn't want to use the helicopter rescue. And it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done because what we had gone up in about two weeks, we went down in 11 hours. We just went straight down and I just had to go through the pain and knew that one, getting to lower altitude would be better for me and two, the, the quicker we got out to the Kahilna Glacier, the quicker we could get the next ski plane out. So it just kept moving, and it was really a force of just complete mental and physical endurance. But I was there because I chose to be there, and I had no one else to blame, <laughs> and I couldn't shout at my boyfriend. Because <laughs> it wasn't his fault that I was suffering. You know, I really, really loved being in the mountains, even though that particular moment was more than unpleasant. So thankfully we did, we did get down and to spend the night and got the ski plane, next ski plane out in the morning and got checked out. Turns out you can actually tear a tendon and it can feel like a cracked rib and who knew? So I still have a desire to go back to to Denali because there's never been a place that I felt more at peace, even as intense and as challenging as it was, just in the middle of the night, not a soul around, and having these glaciers glow purple. Like, and knowing that I'm one of the few human beings that's seen that with my own eyes, it's just absolutely magical. So if you can find something, and it doesn't have to be your work, sometimes the work helps us have our passion elsewhere, or sometimes our work is our passion, but finding something that you love that much can really transform how you show up in the world and how much effort you're willing to put into it. So I kind of sum summarize that the, the obstacles may be large and the suffering may be great, but the roars are also great if you're following your passion. Now the final thing that I'll leave with you is just this concept of real versus perceived fear. So fear used to feel very, very real to me in the work world. I was so afraid of being rejected or being called out or making a mistake or losing a client or whatever the case may have been. But in reality, you know, what are the repercussions? It's very rare that we actually get fired for performance 
issue. You know, you might get laid off, but it's not like, oh, the presentation didn't get well. You're out of here, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're like, no, it's actually hard to fire people sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was in the mountains and I thought about, well, this is, this is what real fear feels like. This is what our bodies are created to actually process fear in this way and have the whole stress response. But in the mountains, I was like, okay, this is, this is good fear. This is fear telling me to take this seriously or to back down or do whatever. And when I would come back to the office, I would be like, well, there's no 3,000 foot cliff there. There's no crevasse there. I'm not gonna get stuck out on Mount Sil with Jeff. Like, what's really going to happen if I take this risk? And the chances are that we're actually, most of the time, there's plenty of other obstacles out there waiting for us. There's glass ceilings, there's corporate restructurings, there's traffic jams. But so many times, we're actually holding ourselves back. We are the obstacle. We say, I don't think I can do that. And then we don't even try. And the interesting thing that I saw in Atlantic Monthly recently was that Women apply for promotion when they meet 100% of qualifications, and men do when they meet 50. So how about looking at those opportunities and saying, I have 50% of what I need. Chances are you'll probably still look at it and go, OK, I need minimum 80, but whatever. <laughs> Let's you know, start with something. And say, I'm going to try. And I'm going to be honest with that client or that employer or whoever about what my qualifications are, and let them take you out of the running. Don't take yourself out of the running. So this is kind of the culmination of all of my climbing career and then professional career boiled down to what was my biggest fear and the biggest risk that I could take. My biggest fear, because I come from you know, pretty much almost no living family and supported myself and paid for all my college and blah, 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 and the violin's playing. <laughs> but is financial insecurity. And it kept me in the corporate world for a really, really long time. And I finally had all of this kind of assimilate into a way that I could really process it and realize how I was holding myself back. So that was about two years ago when I put in my notice at my old investment consulting firm. And I acquired the company Call the Wild, that is all women's adventure travel. And my only plug that I'll say is that we don't do any of this. <laughs> I seem to need a lot to get these lessons through my thick skull. But I realize the impact that it has on women when they even just go hiking and they're not hikers. So they camp for the first time or they backpack for the first time or they go to a developing country for the first time and figure out what can they do that they didn't think they could before. And it is amazing. I, I don't. I don't guarantee transformation, but I create the space for it to happen. And the letters that I get now of like women saying like the horizon looks different now because of this trip that I went on. So that's where I said, what is my real passion? What is my calling? And what is my obstacle? How am I holding myself back? And I finally worked through that. I haven't worked through crying on stage yet. <laughs> I'm working on that. <coughs> so that concludes all of my prepared remarks. And, uh, and I'd love to take questions if you all have any for me. Anybody? Somebody needs tissues. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm just curious, once you make it up there, or any other climbers, I mean, is there anybody that also just like, I just can't go down right now? Like, it's all, or is yeah. that, I mean. Yeah, yeah, that happens. People overextend themselves, and they just don't have the energy, or they get sick, and that's when you hear mostly about the sensational rescue efforts, and then all of the debate about who should be paying, were they responsible, what, you know. Yeah, so that, that definitely does happen. Um, usually, it doesn't, because people that tend to do these kinds of things get pretty good at risk management. And it's funny, from my old Marsha McLennan days, I did um, credit derivatives, but I had to be very knowledgeable about like the insurance jargon. And we talked a lot about frequency versus severity in terms of claims. And so I think about that a lot in the mountains. Like, well, the frequency is really high. People fall a lot here, but there's a really nice run out. So I'm not going to stress too much, and I'm going to go ahead. Or it's very unlikely I fall here, but if I do, I die. Guaranteed. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go there. You know? Or I want protection. I want a rope before I go across this terrain. So it's, um, 
Another thing that's interesting to watch male and female decision making, there's definitely some generalizations that I see about guys being a little more gung-ho, and when I'm in a, a group of all men, I'll tend to be the one that say, all right, let's work backwards. We're going at this pace, we have this many thousand more feet to go, that'll put us in around this time. It's actually when the snow is softening the rock fall, so either we need to speed up or we need to make camp here. And you know, usually they can't really fight with logic, my logic is yeah. somewhat reasonable, but but that, that tends to happen. And it's also, you know, there's the correlation with rattlesnake bites, or it's not that there are 18 to 20 year old men playing with more rattlesnakes, um, it's that they're messing with rattlesnakes. So, <laughs> yeah. Shannon? What are you doing about communication? So I know your cell phone's probably not working on technology. Yeah, I'm a little old school in that regard where I try not to bring communications because when you have a cell phone and you assume that you have rescue on speed dial and then something happens where you don't have cell service or you don't have a battery, that's when you get in trouble versus saying, I'm not going to have any communication. How am I going to manage this? I'm going to leave behind an itinerary. I'm going to not deviate from my itinerary. I'm going to give a time that I'm expected to come out, and I'm going to give my freak out time. So, you know, I should be out of the backcountry by four. If I'm not out by 10, here's, and here's exactly who to call and where to tell them that we'll be. So I really believe in self-sufficiency and not relying on communications. So it's a little different, it's a little different with Call of the Wild, but that's my personal philosophy. So yeah, when, no, no sat phones, I mean, they require batteries, they're really heavy to, yeah. So if you need to call and help, how would you do that then? Well, so it depends on the situation. Either we simply have to get ourselves out of the situation, or if you're in a group that's large enough, you might send someone as a runner to actually go out and get help. I mean, if you don't have cell service, you don't have cell service. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many people you have or how many cell phones you have. Yeah. So when you were hunkered down in that little sand thing, were your two significant others freaking out? No, because we weren't overdue yet. Yeah, and that was also one thing that we knew. That there was no cell service up there. We weren't overdue yet. So we had to, we couldn't just like say, okay, we're gonna call the hell, and they don't come in the middle of the night anyway. So they don't just launch whenever. <laughs> they, you know, they usually wanna have information. When there's a rescue that is um, launched, there are considerations about who's paying for it, how many resources do they have, how dangerous is it. It doesn't matter how much trouble you're in, but if the conditions aren't good for a helicopter to fly, it's not coming. So, you know, again, all these reasons to think about, and it, something may happen someday where you need outside help, but again, no cell phone, we don't ca carry sat phones and everything that we do. So, yeah, we, they would have had to have waited until we were overdue, which would have been like another 24 hours. And that would have been a long time to be up there. Yeah. I'm gonna do the one in the back. Oh, I just had a question. I saw that there was the picture where you had the rope hanging down. Yeah. And I assume you both went down the rope? Yes. So how did you get the rope down after that? Oh, so we literally just lassoed it over a rope. Normally it will go through rappel rings, so mm -hmm. once you both slither down the rope, then you pull one side and it comes through the rappel rings. In that situation, we just pulled one side and it comes over the rope, it comes over the rock. There's one of the potential complications is that the rope gets stuck in a rock somewhere along the way, and that's like the worst case scenario, so you're always like, Please let the rope come. Please let the rope come. <laughs> Otherwise, you literally have to figure out a way to climb back up and get it unstuck. Yeah. And you just leave the ring there. So with the ones where they're rings, they're, they are traditional rappel stations that are left behind. So numerous climbers come down and do that because we were going down a non-traditional descent route. We were just having to lasso it over a rock that we thought would hold. That's why that was so scary. Um, how long was it between when you first you know, wanted to climb a mountain and then you actually did it? What was the training? Well, for actual summiting, I think it was about September, July. September. Yeah, it was about 10 or 11 months. So I first really got the bug captured me when I hiked half dome, just because that last cable section was so hard and so scary. And, and I yeah, used to have not that I don't have a fear of heights anymore, but I used to like really feel intensely about it. And I made it through Half Dome, and uh, it was just like, oh, I need this, I need like some culmination of my efforts. So it's kind of ruined for plain vanilla hiking. Like just, 
hiking around. I was like, I gotta get to the top of something. <laughs> and about a month later, I was in Germany. That was um, September of like 2004, I think. And the highest mountain in Germany was right next to where we were vacationing. So I was like, we have to climb Zugspitze. It's right there, it's the highest mountain. And I remember my boyfriend at the time, who had a very thick German accent, was like, we cannot climb that mountain. It's too difficult. You don't understand. There's no liability here. We could get killed. You know? I was like, yeah, it'll be fine. Let's hire a guy. I remember getting up at like four in the morning to meet the guy at six, and he made some comment about wishing he had a girlfriend that liked shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and he also almost got pro soccer. And remember, this is an athletic me, and I did really well on that climb. Like the guy said, wow, you must be really fit. No one's ever called me fit before. <laughs> <laughs> I like this movie. I'm actually good at it. So I basically came back from that trip and just like surfed the web every night till midnight, figuring out what was this climbing thing, what did I like, and I was absolutely mesmerized by the pictures of the people roped together going up snow slopes. I had never seen that before. I had no idea what it was even called, but I knew I wanted to do that. But apparently, that's a relatively rare story. A lot of times. It will be a man, man in your life, boyfriend, brother, whomever, that says like, hey, let's go try climbing. And sometimes that doesn't go very well. Like People will get, get um, them in over their heads and don't have a good experience. It's like getting having your friends throw you on a black diamond when you're still on the greens. <laughs> Not fun. So that experience was like really pivotal for me. And, I just, that was when I said, okay, if I want to do that, I figured out what was that? What, where would you do it? And what was required for it? And that's when I went out and started acquiring. I did a basic mountaineering class. I did a snow camping class. I hadn't even been backpacking in my life before. I hadn't been camping since I was a Girl Scout. And so in those about six months or so, I you know, pretty much obsessively acquired all of those skills and then went on several guided climbs and, and was not able to summit for a number of reasons. And then finally, got up Shasta the next July. So it took a long time. Yeah. And you mentioned you never did uh, like uh, backpacking or this type of thing. Then how did you know your passion is climbing? Like, it wasn't until I sort of had that experience of falling into it. Like one, the half dome, and working through my fear on the cables and feeling the sense of accomplishment because my friend and I had done it together and we actually trained for it and figured out like, oh, it's really long. People go wrong, they don't bring enough water, they don't bring the gloves for the cables, so we were pretty diligent about preparing for it. We got to the base of the cables and she kind of freaked out with the sense of heights and said, I'll take as long as you want, you go for it. And I was really nervous because you can see, it's very unlikely, this is the frequency severity thing, very unlikely that you fall off the cables on half dome, right? But the one person that does it a year of the 1500 that do it, then that makes the news. But still, you're up, you know, hiking up, holding onto these cables, looking over, going, if I lift it, then I go down there. So it was really scary. And I didn't have somebody with me saying, you can do this, don't worry, here's how to do it. So that was, that was really the thing. Like, I didn't know beforehand mm -hmm. that I would have such a transformative experience from just hiking Half Dome. But that was the thing that really did it. And then after that, I just started chipping away and doing a little bit more and a little bit more. And, finding out like, yeah, I really do like the snow stuff and I like the rock stuff a little bit less and I really like, I've done a lot of climbing internationally and not as much domestically because I like the added adventure of developing <coughs> countries. I discovered slowly but surely that it was unusually good at a high altitude. Um, part of that's just because I'm small, that I have to go slower and by going slowly, that's better for climatization than actually pushing really hard and putting your body in a position where you have to recover which a lot of the tall people, fit people, uh, young people tend to do because they can push hard, they do, and then they can't recover. And here I am plodding along, total tortoise in here, and I get into camp an hour later, but I feel good because I haven't, I haven't overextended myself. And so then I was like, well, not only am I good at it, but I also like it. So it's been an, an evolution. I didn't, I never in a million years would have said the day after I hiked Half Dome that I would try to climb Makalu. The first, um, image is Makalu, which is the fifth highest mountain in the world in Nepal, and I have a million stories just from that that one climb, mostly how not to climb an 8,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's the other thing, is like, as you're thinking about, you know, life and objectives and where you want to go, 
it's amazing how many twists and turns we take. And you set down one path and you either have an obstacle that totally stops you or just makes you reevaluate what you're trying to do. And you might go in another one and that's totally valid. We don't know for sure exactly where we'll end up. I didn't, I had no idea four years ago that I would be running Call of the Wild now. Any other questions? Yeah? So what's your ultimate? What's what's the one that you still want to do? Uh, there's many. I'm, I'm much more attracted by really interesting and unique mountains. So in March, I'll be going to Uganda to do the Ruanzori Mountains, the Mountains of the Moon. So there's three high peaks that are pretty technical that are over 16,000 feet. So super remote, developing country, high altitude, multidisciplinary, it's glacier and rock, like that totally, I'm so inspired by that, and it doesn't have to be that high. I do wanna climb Everest, and I feel like I say it's every year it's gonna be the next year, but it's hard to get together the, the funds for it. Um, but that's sort of a, because it's the highest, not because I'm in love with the mountain, or the aesthetic, or the uniqueness of it, it's because it is the mountain. Cool. Well, one more? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about, from a career perspective, after 17 years in the corporate world, you decided to, to take a transition. Um, what were the steps that you went through in your mind that led you to that decision? Because you don't just wake up one day and say, I'm leaving, you know, doing this yeah. other thing. Uh, I know it's a process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was. and. It honestly surprised myself a little bit because investing that much time and like all those designations and all that was a fair bit of effort and working my way through and up the ranks and all of that. But I found that I really loved working with my clients and helping them achieve their goals. I'm a very uh, outwardly focused person. Like even now I really want my clients to be really happy. But there are a couple of things, and it's mostly about corporate culture in general that I had issues with. I just didn't like the fact that, you know, I had to work late and fly all weekend, and I seemed to maybe I didn't pick the best bosses, but <laughs> you know, must be there at 8 a.m. or else we're going to have a meeting about your dedication. Like, really, I'm managing seven billion dollars and have the highest client load, and you know, got in at 1 a.m. like. There should be some leeway so that you can have a personal life. Um, I also tore my ACL snowshoeing. Uh, I seem to only get injured doing non-risky activities. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a difficult time recovering and I couldn't get the time that I needed to do physical therapy. Um, so it's kind of like, I feel like some corporate situations, it's like you have to give your body to the company. And I totally reject that. Like your health is number one. If you can't take care of yourself, if you can't get in at a reasonable hour, get a workout in, have a healthy meal, get a good night's sleep. These are kind of basic human rights, right? So it's like, oh, for us white color workers. But seriously, like you need to be able to treat your body well in order to be productive. And that was one of the things where I was like, oh, I think I'm gonna have a heart attack by the time I turn 50. And there also wasn't much respect for my endeavors. I got feedback that it gave the perception that I didn't have a sense of urgency about my work because I wouldn't have so much energy to do this if I was giving my all to my work. So the, all of these things made me go like, well, you know, just because I'm good at finance and I've invested all this time and I have all these credentials doesn't necessarily mean that at any point you can't say, I'm going to shift and I'm going to change. It's basically a sunk cost at this point. And I still use it, you know, with the treasure position at the Compton Foundation. But th those were the things that made me say, I've got to look and see what else could be out there. And then there was a series of, I actually did get a coach and you know, did a lot of visioning, like really being careful about crafting what I wanted my life to look like. And it was a big transition. I, I left California, I bought a house in Bend, I bought the company, um, initially broke up with the boyfriend, like ripped all the band-aids off. I was like, if I'm going to recreate my ideal life, I have the opportunity now, it's no holds barred. And that's, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow up question on that? Yeah. So I was at a law firm for over a decade. I'm a partner. I left. And I thought about it for a long time. But I would wake up every morning, I just did this this summer, I would wake up every morning for about four months before I left, and I would be petrified. Yeah. And the only way I dealt with it was, I kept saying, 
it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be afraid. You haven't really talked about how you, I mean, what do you deal with when you have fear? Okay, so is it just purely intellectual? Do you analyze it and say, well, this is real, this is whatever, or I'm just not going to think about it? Actually, how do you deal with the fear? There's a few things that I do. One is having that goal and really visualizing it. And I do a few tricks where I like put pictures of the mountain or I put pictures of myself in bed so that for the solid year beforehand, whenever I had a bad day at work, I would look at that picture and be like, this is what I'm working towards. But I, you know, had pretty, pretty extreme fear, I would say. I had a lot of moments like that, but the goal felt right. I crafted it well and it was, it was worth working for. It was worth dealing with that fear. And I still deal with it every day. Like, did I make the right thing? I'll say that financially it is not very lucrative to run an adventure travel company. So I'm still like, that is real fear that I experience on a daily basis. But is it worth it? So if it, if it wasn't inspiring enough, I, I would stop and I would go back to the corporate world. And that's the other thing, thinking about what are my options? I still have all of this experience and all of these connections. I also had a partner. So this coach that I worked with for a year and a half, I picked him in particular because of his program. We did a whole weekend called Vision Quest Weekend, some woo-woo stuff, some practical stuff, but then kept working on a monthly basis. I'm like, what are you, what are you chipping away? It's such a huge goal, such a huge goal to turn your life on its head, right? Then it took me about a year and a half. And so every month we talk about what are you doing in this arena? What are you doing in this arena? Okay, you've you know gone up and, and checked out real estate in Bend. Okay, you've started talking with the Call of the Wild owner. Okay, you've gotten this guide certification. Okay, you've squirreled away that money. All right. So just taking those baby steps along the way definitely helped. Uh, there's not a whole lot else to it besides just going like the fear is real. And what are, the, what are the repercussions if your worst fears come true? And can I handle that compared to what's the reward if I am successful? So that's like my constant you know, thought process. Of, I'm always working through that. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned in your um, presentation about the role of mentors. And you mentioned about the, that you've chosen male mentors. Specifically, I'm not sure if that was deliberate or just happened. Um, yep. Do you? So I have a few male mentors that I find very, very effective, and quite frankly, more effective than some of the women mentors that I have, for many reasons. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experience with that? And, and I just want to kind of compare it to how I'm feeling with my mentors, and see yep. if there's a trend here or or or, or something else. So it wasn't really on purpose. It was a little bit more that the financial world and the mountaineering world is male dominated. So those who have expertise and those who are in leadership positions tend to be male. So I was grateful that these men were still supportive of me, that my six foot two tall guy would cut small steps, remembering that there was a short female. And I remembered that, like you always have to think about somebody else's perspective when you're leading them. However, with the coach, I, I did pick him, not necessarily because he was male, but because he basically looks like this huge Navy SEAL. But he talks about like hypnotherapy and working with your subconscious and he's super woo woo. So it's like, oh, he has just the right combination of like being able to work through my fears and all this inner stuff, but yet getting my ambition. So I feel like if you're, if you're totally new agey, like you go to Spirit Rock, it's like, oh, well, be happy with what you have. I'm like, no, I need more. <laughs> you know, I need somebody that understands why do I want to go so far? Why do I need to push so far and not try to get me to rein back, but to say, let's, let's go for it and I'll help you get there. So he had that right combination of just being this really big presence and really obviously got the physical because of his own physical aspect. But he also had a very feminine side to him of like really dealing with like, where does that come from? What are your blockages? What's in your past making you be so afraid? And let's work through that. And I really trusted him. So I'm not, I'm not so sure it was just because he was male, but he happened to be a man with those aspects. And that's why I really liked him as a potential coach. Anyone else that was too you know, soft and like just trying to support me along the way, I really needed somebody that could push me hard. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we're actually maybe running even a little bit over, but I'm happy to hang out 
and take some questions. And if you are interested in Call of the Wild, I have a little brochure here. And like I said, there's hiking, lodges, Cinque Terre wine, gelato. <laughs> <laughs> All of this, you know. Yeah.